apologizing? Why aren't you begging for forgiveness? Okay. Emily tries to use her words to confront Luke, but this is a man who refuses to be held accountable on any single level. So I don't know if you guys have watched Fair Play on Netflix starring Phoebe Dinever and Alden Ehrenreich, but my favorite scene without giving away too many spoilers was the part where Phoebe's character Emily ends her toxic relationship with Alden's character Luke by whispering, I'm done with you now. And it sent shivers down my spine. Shivers of satisfaction. The movie itself received very mixed reviews, a 3.1 out of 5 from the audience, but 85% on Rotten Tomatoes and 73% on Metacritic. I personally thought it was brilliant. It was the perfect representation of the toxic relationship I wasted two whole years of my life on. It was spot on. From the way the relationship began, to the shift in power dynamics, to the way Luke made Emily look like she was the crazy one, and even the passive-aggressive comments were exactly like the ones I used to get. My mum says you're weak. You need to be more assertive. Don't say you're unemployed, even as a joke. It looks bad. They're just jealous of us. <laughs> And when confronted, he would say, What you're doing now is exactly why I broke up with you. It's like dating a 14-year-old. Stop spamming me. Up until then, I never understood how jealousy towards your partner's achievements, popularity, etc. could exist in a romantic relationship. He showed me it could. And Prince Charles did as well. He showed me the pain of being idealized and then having that pedestal ripped from underneath you. But when one person withdraws, the other begins to chase. And so began this push and pull, this hellish tango. And the more I was loving and caring towards him, the more he hated me. This is the Madonna whore complex. And it's the first sign that you're wasting your time in a relationship. I've spoken about the Madonna whore complex briefly in my previous video, how sexy is hurting your image. But to recap, the Madonna whore complex is a Freudian term used to describe a man who sees women either as pure and saintly or dirty and promiscuous. Freud wrote, where such men love, they have no desire, and where they desire, they cannot love. So the more he sees you as Madonna, the less he is sexually attracted to you and even though he is attracted to the whore he cannot love or respect her how strange so where does this complex come from well when a boy is three to six years old he will develop an attraction to his mother and a sense of rivalry with his father this is called the oedipus complex phase i know so many complexes but Bear with me. So for boys who had an overly cold or distant mother, they were unable to pass through this phase properly and thus developed a Madonna whore complex, which prevents them from seeing women as both nurturing and sexual. For girls, this phase is called the Electra complex. And if they are not guided through this phase properly either, they can develop something called daddy issues. I'll link a YouTube short in the description box so you can see the Electra Complex in action. And I'll also link an article on the relationship between the Madonna whore complex and COVID narcissism, because that's what my ex was, a COVID narcissist. And I'm not just saying it because I don't like him. He told me that he was diagnosed with this. And at the tender age of 22, I had never heard of such a thing, which is why I didn't run the other way screaming. But the diagnosis was so specific that I remembered it, which was handy because I later did a ton of research on narcissism when our relationship was going to shit. Oh, and the only reason why he told me was because we had just started dating for a couple months, maybe four or five and things were really getting out of hand for me he was being jealous and unreasonable and so i had my mind half made up i knew i was probably going to break up with him and that's why he told me that he was a covert narcissist to garner sympathy a classic move out of the narcissist playbook so to quickly illustrate the connection between covert narcissism and the madonna hall complex we'll use my toxic ex as an example and we'll call him Brad. In the beginning, Brad was perfect. He would say and do all the right things. I was really thinking that he could be the one. But then Brad started to create this 
hot and cold dynamic. This was done to keep me always on edge as the relationship was never predictable and unpredictability fosters an addiction. He found out what my addiction was before I did. My addiction was to love. It was an addiction that I didn't even know I had. So the unpredictability and the hot and cold dynamic really knocked me off balance because things were going so great. What happened? Why would he all of a sudden go cold on me? Was it something I said or did? Well, no, I didn't say or do anything wrong. This was a manipulation tactic and he was in fact priming me for the next stage, which was where he would frequently create drama to seek attention in order to bring out my Madonna. You see, he knew that I'd be more patient after he'd been so perfect in the beginning. He knew I'd be more pliable after making me doubt myself by bringing in this hot and cold dynamic to the relationship. And as mentioned earlier, the more he pushed me away, the more I wanted to win back his affection. But the more I tried to win back his affection, the more devalued I felt, and the more I was unknowingly fueling his narcissistic supply. Eventually, Brad geared up to discard me by talking to other girls. He tried to cover up his promiscuity by gaslighting me and accusing me of being unfaithful. This process of love bombing, devaluation and discardment is how the narcissist target is passed through the narcissistic supply chain. And the oil that lubricates the system is the Madonna whore complex. When a man has Madonna whore complex, it is the first sign that a relationship is most likely going to be a waste of time. The second sign that he's most likely going to waste your time is if he exhibits several narcissistic traits. This one is super obvious because I've probably said the word narcissist 10 times throughout this video already. But since there's a lot of overlap when it comes to the Madonna whore complex and narcissism, you can't really speak of one without speaking of the other. And it just so happened that Brad was an actual diagnosed COVID narcissist. But a person doesn't need to be diagnosed with a pathological narcissistic disorder to be narcissistic. Oftentimes, a narcissist would never willingly deliver themselves to a therapist's doorstep because they don't feel there's anything wrong with them. Even the covert narcissists who usually play victim to get attention. So it's highly likely that we have a bunch of undiagnosed pathological narcissists running around. But as we've discussed in several previous videos, everything exists on a spectrum, including narcissism. So what you might not know is that a healthy person with a healthy ego will normally have a certain amount of narcissism mixed in with their other personality traits. This graph shows narcissism on a spectrum from healthy to unhealthy or pathological, with the most severe traits of clinical narcissism being absence of conscience, a pathological need for power and control, the desire to manipulate for profit or amusement, the need to win at all costs, and having a sadistic streak. A step down from that is being emotionally shallow, lacking empathy, having a sense of entitlement, and devaluing others. Dr. Romani, one of my favorite YouTubers slash psychologists, further defines narcissists as being admiration and validation seeking and easily envious. They have an incapacity for intimacy and instead they exploit and use people in relationships. They often present with dysregulated anger and will have two faces, the validation seeking face in public and the abusive one in private, as well as a chronic egocentricity, which means that everything revolves around them, their needs, their feelings and their desires. Anyone in your life who exhibits any of the traits listed above should be mentally flagged, as this points to someone who is, at the very least, emotionally stunted, if not narcissistic. If they're also unable to take constructive criticism, to self-reflect, or if they always put the blame on others, then this shows they are also lacking in self-awareness, which is the last and biggest sign that this person is going to be a time drain. However, where the sign differs from the other two is that you don't necessarily have to be a narcissist or have a Madonna whore complex to lack self-awareness, even though people who are narcissists will usually have a Madonna whore complex and a lack of self-awareness. So a lack of self-awareness could simply be due to age, naivete, lack of experience or lack of perspective. But from my own personal experience, these people will almost never change because they lack the perspective to even identify the problem. But you, bestie, need to identify and avoid these people because I didn't and it cost me dearly. So how did the saga with Brad finally end? On March 7th, 2018, my best friend died and I couldn't even say goodbye because we weren't 
in the same country when she passed. But I was beside myself with grief. It was the second time in my life a death had impacted me so deeply, the first time being my dad when I was eight years old. I received the news that morning from my friend's father and decided to take the day off from work. And because I was still living in Paris at the time and had no one else to call, I called Brad and he told me that he'd come as soon as he finished work. But at around 11 p.m. to midnight, he stumbles through the door and tells me, oh, I'm sorry, um, I was late because I had to go out for drinks after work. And that was the moment I said, I'm done with you. It's interesting how death puts everything nicely into perspective. And it's also sad that it had to come to this for me to realize that I'd wasted so much time on this person, to realize that my heart had had checked out such a long time ago and that it was my stupid ego who'd kept me in the game because she just wanted to win in the end. And for what? On some level, I guess I just wanted my happy ending. That's why we attract the same people and reenact the same trauma because we want to subconsciously fix what happened to us. But in that moment, the moment where Brad announced that he'd gone to see a friend while I was in so much pain, I realized that he was selfish, he was never going to change, and therefore I needed to change. And I suddenly snapped out of the sick trance I'd been in. At first, I was super angry with myself because how could I have been so wrong about someone? Look at all the time and energy I wasted on this sick person, all this time and energy that I could have been channeling into something positive, and then, I was filled with motivation and the courage to make some real changes because look at how short life is. I vowed from then on I would live my life to the fullest for my best friend who couldn't. And yes, all this was happening in that very moment where I said to Brad, I'm done with you. I cried after he left, but I knew I'd only be sad for a little while, whereas he'd suffer for a lifetime and not even know why. And to me, that would be punishment enough. Okay, fine. In retrospect, Brad wasn't a complete waste of time, but only because I decided to see him as a lesson and learn from my mistake, which prevented me from making more mistakes, which thereby prevented me from wasting more time. So what did this emotional roller coaster with Brad teach me? Well, I'm now able to spot emotional maturity and intelligence, or a lack thereof, within the first few times of meeting a person. I was able to fix my own toxic traits and I can now take accountability for my part in a situation without feeling the need to lay the blame on someone or something. And I can take accountability without feeling defensive because like it or not, it does take two to clap. I learned to kindly but firmly maintain boundaries and not just define them, which is the easy part. And I now tend to respond rationally as opposed to reacting emotionally. I also learned to really see people for who they are instead of what they could be or what I wanted them to be. And I learned the hard way, but actions really do speak much louder than words. For all my love of words, I have to say that sometimes talk is cheap. Through this experience, I learned how to let go without needing closure from someone else because when you know, you know. When you know, you don't need someone else to confirm what you already know. The only reason why you'd need someone to confirm what you already know by giving you closure is because you don't trust yourself. Which brings me to my last point. Through this toxic relationship, I learned to trust my intuition, goddammit. But before I learned how to do these things that I had just listed, I had to confront my shadow. And thanks to Brad, I saw my shadow for the first time. I saw how ugly and vulnerable but formidable I could be, and I was amazed. And not always in a good way, but maybe I needed someone who really triggered my insecurities to bring out the side of me so that I could master it. One of the most unforgettable lessons I learned from Dr. Jordan Peterson, despite some of his more radical viewpoints, was the concept of growing teeth. In a video, which I'll link below, he says, it's impossible to respect yourself until you grow teeth. He taught me that incorporating the monster within or the shadow is what gives us 
character and self-respect. In the same video, he goes on to say, if you're not capable of cruelty, you're absolutely a victim to anyone who is. Vegetius, a Roman military expert and writer from the late 4th century, confirms this saying, let him who desires peace prepare for war. And believe you me, I was not prepared for war. My world had been void of deliberately malicious romantic partners before Brad. But at the very root of it, I was the problem. Sure, it wasn't my fault that I'd suffered narcissistic abuse and that I'd grown up in a dysfunctional family, but it was my responsibility as an adult to fix myself. And the truth was that I had a weak ego and low self-esteem. The person who thought I wasn't good enough wasn't Brad. On the contrary, the reason why he felt he needed to use all these manipulation tactics and all this other stuff was because he felt I was good enough and so he needed to hold me down. No, the only person who didn't think I was good enough was me. And that's how I came to the powerful conclusion that I was the one keeping myself stuck. I know it's unfair to say that most relationships are a waste of time and I can already feel that people will have an issue with this phrasing, but think about it this way. If you're looking for that one special person, most of our relationships will kind of be a waste of time. This doesn't mean that you can't make beautiful memories with them or learn something from them or that they weren't meant to be in your life. Maybe meeting these people was unavoidable and while we can only accept the unavoidable, we can also take measures to prevent ourselves from wasting more time than necessary. So at one point we need to simply cut our losses and go. But when is that point? In general, when something isn't for you or is no longer serving you, it just doesn't bring you emotional fulfillment. If it isn't building you up, it's keeping you stagnant or worse, tearing you down. If something really isn't for you, you will feel drained because you'll be the only one giving, 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 giving. Eventually, it will take a toll on not only your mental health, but also your work, your friendships, and so on and so forth. And to recap, in the context of relationships, the biggest sign that someone isn't for you is if he has a serious case of Madonna Hall complex or or if he has narcissistic traits, or if he lacks self-awareness. But let's be honest, I think we all know when something isn't for us, but when we're younger, we tend not to listen to our intuition because we don't trust ourselves enough. If you're struggling with this, my suggestion is to work on your self-esteem, confront your shadow, and learn to take accountability for your part in things because Taking accountability actually gives you your power back. It's not about blame and it doesn't take away from the fact that this person hurt you and what they did was wrong. But is this life going to be about them or will this life be about you? Now, before I finish this video and play the outro music, I just wanted to remind you guys that I have a free Be Your Own Therapist manual, which you can download by subscribing to my newsletter, The Jaybird Journal. I send out one newsletter a week on average, so I promise you won't be bombarded with spam. But yes, I just wanted to let you know that I'm a clinical hypnotherapist and I designed this manual to help people with emotion regulation, which is a skill that I strongly believe should be taught a lot more in schools. I don't enjoy doing plugs and this is the first time I'm mentioning my Be Your Own Therapist manual in a video, but I realized that if I don't talk about it, you guys might not know that it even exists. So, now you know.